Omar Javari Salamanca is a research fellow in the Department of Conflict and Development at Ghent University and an associate researcher at the Observatoire de Mondes Arabes et Musulmans at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Previously, he was based at Columbia University as a Marie Curie Fellow in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies. He's completing his first book manuscript, Fabric of Life, the Infrastructure of Colonial Capitalism in Palestine, to be published with Versa Books. Recent work considers imperial geographies of infrastructure, urban political ecology, labor, and social movements. Omar is on the editorial board of Antipode, Acme, and Chadalia Cities member of the steering community of the International Critical Geographic Group and programmer for the Ion Palestine Arts and Film Festival. Welcome, Omar. Thank you very much. Okay, buona tarda, good uh, afternoon. Um, thanks, Rosa, for inviting me and thank you all for coming and staying. I'm Imagine you must be all looking forward to start the weekend, so I'll try to be as brief and engaging as possible. So what I'm going to do today is to introduce a um, part of a book, a chapter of a book that I've been working on for a long time, um, that tries to explore the histories and geographies of infrastructure in Palestine. Um, and when I um, say infrastructure, I'm referring to road networks and electricity uh, grids, which uh, doesn't sound to be very sexy, but turns out to be a very interesting endeavor. Um, so what I do is to use infrastructure as an entry point, as an ethnographic object uh, and a, a relational archive. Um, the aim of the research uh, is to better understand how settler colonial and capitalist forms of dispossession materialize in a space as profoundly uh, contested processes. Um, the various chapters of the book uh, use different controversies, different cases throughout Palestine. Um, and what I do is to look through these different cases into uh, different questions around material dispossession. Um, so I would use um, different broad cases or electricity, for instance, the history of the Jerusalem Electricity Company, uh, which is a nearly 100-year-old company based in Jerusalem that distributes electricity to Palestinians uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, and I will use that case to explore questions of sovereignty uh, and how sovereignty becomes rewired when uh, Zionism and settler colonialism arrives in Palestine. And I do that with all the different cases in order to look at questions of social reproduction, which is what I'm going to be talking today. Um, I look at questions of citizenship uh, with regards to uh, infrastructure struggles in the Nakab, in the Negev. Um, and um, I also uh, uh, look at um, uh, road networks as a way to explore segregation and uh, racialized forms of segregation. Um, so today, what I'm going to be doing is to focus on the Gaza Strip, um, and more particularly on the destruction of the electricity power plant by the Israeli army in 2006. Um, and um, what I'm trying to do is to try to think about this network's infrastructure which are the essential services of life that sustain life, right? We need water, we need electricity. And I'm trying to think uh, about this infrastructure as a means of social reproduction. Social reproduction being a very sort of feminist concept, and I'm trying to work through that um, as a way to explore infrastructure. Um, and in doing so, what I try to figure out is what has been happening in Gaza, and I try to figure out how uh, settler colonialism is operating um, in the past and in the present um, by looking at these uh, networks. So before I begin, I want to give you a little sense. I really don't know what you guys are into in terms of um, what are your interests or how the program looks like, um, but I will try to um, give you a brief of the kinds of things I'm looking at and how they provoke a certain departure or challenge certain uh, scholarship uh, that exists already either around Palestine or around infrastructure studies. Uh, so the first point is that uh, Palestine has been, uh, for the last um, 
especially the last two, three decades, and particularly after the Oslo Accords in the early 1990s, when the Palestinians signed a peace accord with the Israelis, a so-called peace accord, uh, Palestine has been understood as an occupation. Um, so whenever you hear about Palestine, it would be uh, occupation this, occupation that, occupation of the West Bank, occupation of Gaza. We rarely hear about anything else uh, that has to do with Palestinians living in Israel today, right? That for Palestinians um, it still remains a fundamental um, part of the Palestinian body politic from uh, the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordanian River as an entire coherent body politic that has been gradually and historically fragmented because of the settler colonial project. So um, one of the things this book does is that incorporates the settler colonial paradigm. Um, and settler colonialism, um, what it does is to make Palestine an unexceptional case. Many of, very often we hear about Palestine being the longest occupation ever, um, which is not really even true, uh, because you would have, for instance, Kashmir, that has been just um, um, fully reoccupied by uh, India recently, has also been one of those longest occupations. But the idea is that the settler colonial paradigm, which is a form of colonialism, all of a sudden it enables us and help us to see Palestine in comparative perspective with other settler colonial contexts. Now, the difference between colonialism and settler colonialism can be explained um, by giving a couple examples. So, for instance, if you imagine Belgium uh, colonizing the Congo, that would be a colonial context, or the British uh, colonizing India, that would be a colonial context, where the colonizers arrive into these uh, spaces in order to mostly extract resources, right? Economic resources and exploit the population as um, labor, um, etc. Now, settler colonialism is slightly different. Um, in that it can ex uh, exploit the, the population and extract resources, but the ultimate goal of settler colonialism is to size the land, take the land, and has a logic of elimination, which elimination might mean, I think, is larger than genocide, in that elimination can take various different forms. It can take certainly the elimination of indigenous peoples, but it can also be a way of integrating the indigenous populations once they've been reduced into a tiny minority, incorporate them as citizens in the settler, um, in the new settler polity, right? So this is extremely important and has been extremely important for many of us to make sense of Palestine, not as an exceptional case, but as something that we compare with other settler colonial cases, like for instance, the United States, Canada, you might recall recently that there were the protests in Standing Rock, the United States is a settler colonial context, right? South Africa is a settler colonial context. Um, um, Algiers is a settler colonial context. Australia is a settler colonial context, and so is Israel-Palestine. Uh, so that's one of the first uh, premises of this uh, study. The other premise, what I'm trying to do, is to try to understand what a colonial context, past and present, an ongoing settler colonial context, can do to push um, traditional analysis of capitalism. What happens when, if we understand Palestine to be a settler colonial context, where the logic is not to have a proletariat to be exploited, but rather to eliminate the population, what does that say to a capitalist um, perspective, right? So I try to see the intersection between colonialism and capitalism, right? And for that, I try to stretch some concepts like primitive accumulation, which Mark developed as a concept, as a way to, um, sort of discuss very much that moment of primitive accumulation that enabled capitalism to happen. So Marx understood primitive accumulation as something primitive in the past, which then would stop at some point and would enable industrialization to happen. So many of the indigenous natives' perspectives, settler colonial perspectives, argue that the primitive is not primitive, but rather an ongoing accumulation, right? And you would have people like David Harvey maybe arguing accumulation by dispossession, even though many of these people are not necessarily taking into consideration the particularities of a colonial context. So that would be the second premise. The third one is what I'm trying to do with the book, is trying to figure out and work through infrastructure. What does it mean to work, as I was saying, with something as banal as a road or electricity? What is there 
in these kind of objects um, that might be interesting for scholarship, for theory, for practice, uh, even for political practice. Um, um, and so back again to the Stanley Brook case, what you know, I'm trying to figure out is uh, how infrastructure networks are very contested in the moment of their production, when they are built, like the pipeline in a standing rock, they are contested. But also, once they are settled, when they have like a rupture and they spill and they create environmental problems, or when all of a sudden, say, electricity becomes privatized and they introduce prepaid meters, infrastructures are often contested. So that's one of the things. But what I'm also very interested in is in trying to figure out how digging the histories of these infrastructures, and if we understand infrastructures as an archive, um, we can find um, not only these contested stories that we can recuperate to see how people have organized and the ways in which these uh, networks have been built. Um, and so the way in which I approach infrastructures, and that's why I'm saying trying to ground infrastructure, infrastructure say as a, as a concept and you know those infrastructure studies that have been done in a lot of Western contexts, how does it look like from a Southern context, right? From a different sort of like uh, positionality, if you will. Um, and I do that by, by considering, I don't know if you're familiar with this term, but assemblage or new materialism, uh, different sort of like Latour, I don't know if it rings a bell, but you know, these kind of approaches that considers infrastructure as a broad assemblage of different actors, right? So the wire and the generator uh, and the worker and the institution that runs the electricity all form part of this radical relational assemblage that it's important to explore and investigate to see which role each of these actors have both human and non-human, and what are the impacts of, of this. I mean, we can talk about that later. Um, but this is a lot, as I was saying, has to do in critical geography. They call these more than human geographies because all of a sudden we are decentering the human which has been always at the center of a lot of the research and investigations, uh, and we are recentering objects, right? And an object can be a table, or it can be in a lab, it can be something else, it can be animals, it can be nature, um, even though we are also nature, but you know, it, it's a much more expanded um, sort of uh, analytic <laughs> that decenters the human as the center object of analysis and looks at these relations happening together. And so finally, what I tried to do with this book is by looking at this infrastructure and look at these different processes, um, I tried to um, recover indigenous uh, histories of a struggle in order to assert um, um, the political role and continuity of these struggles and try to see whether we can figure out um, different uh, political horizons. So that's a bit kind of the, um, the context of uh, the book. And now, I'm just going to uh, go in this, um, in this case. I'm going to read a couple pages and then I'm back to, uh, back to you. I find uh, the easier uh, for the introduction to go through if I read. So please uh, bear with me. So during the past decade, power rationing and rolling blackouts have defined the daily reality for most of the two million people in the besieged and overcrowded Gaza Strip. The hardship of living without a steady flow of electricity has been exacerbated by a sustained military campaign of air, sea, and land attacks, and by a deep crisis resulting from an 11-year closure imposed by Israel with the support of Egypt and the acquiescence of the Palestinian Authority. A consequence of these appealing conditions has been the slashing in the amount of electricity available to consistently run the five waste water treatment plants in the Gaza Strip. When there is electricity to power lagoons, treatment works and sewage pumps, to make a choice, um, sorry, waste managers at Gaza's coastal municipalities, water and utilities are forced to make a choice between stop flooding in cities or release sewage directly into the sea. These days, about 110,000 cubic meters of untreated and partially treated sewage, the equivalent of 43 Olympic-sized swimming pools, are discharged daily into the Mediterranean Sea through riverbeds that snake along urban areas in the Gaza Strip or pump directly into the coastline through major sewage outlets. Two-thirds of Gaza's Mediterranean coast, uh, two-thirds, which is about 40 kilometers long, has been designated as highly polluted due to untreated sewage. 
Despite warnings by local health officials and a swimming ban in large tracts of the coastline, for many families, the beach remains the only affordable form of recreation and escape from heat, humidity, and the, suffoca the suffocating reality. The looming tragedy hit on July 2017 when amid blistering summer heat and ongoing power cuts that left Gazans with an average of three hours of electricity per day, Mohammed Salim al Sayez, five years old, died days after swimming in Sheikh Echlin, one of Gaza's city's most popular beaches. Diagnosed with Ikiri syndrome, a disease caused by the Shigella bacteria, al Sayez swallowed sewage laced seawater, causing oxygen deprivation and fatal brain damage. He was reportedly the first death caused by sea pollution in the Gaza Strip. Two weeks earlier, after sewage was detected in seawater, the Israeli Health Ministry banned swimming on Sikkim and Ashkelon uh, National Park, beaches that are bordering with the north of the Gaza Strip. Bacterial-based disease and toxic pollution know no borders. Denial of power supply to those whose material world is built on an excessive attachment to electricity means lives at risk, dehumanizing experiences, and sometimes death. This eliminatory, rela eliminatory relation of force is, as Loren Berlan puts it, one of cruel optimism, which exists when something you desire is actually an obstacle to your flourishing. A longing for electricity to cope with the summer heat is what pushed Mohammed al Sayed's father in the first place to bring his family to a sea precisely in peril because of electricity deprivation. Thinking from and with Gaza uh, City, Haidar Aid, uh, writes about what it means to be a hostage of electricity. Quote, Gassans die every day but death from illness as a result of dirty water or the lack of a life-saving operation. A starvation due to the crops that fail to grow without sufficient irrigation. Or babies dying because they cannot be kept warm in the first few days of life. Aid captures not only the often invisible and quotidian infrastructural violence that demarcates Palestinian life and death under siege, he also underlines its insidious temporality. Beyond, or rather in addition to, fast forms of killing marked by immediate, spectacular, and sensational visibility, Gazans are also subject to a concealed and incremental form of violence that debilitates, injures, and wounds life over time. This is what Rob Nixon uh, calls a slow violence, which is a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, an attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. Life in the concentration camp, in the prison, in the reserve, is, borrowing from Laura Pulido, a life mediated by a state that actively sanctions and produces racial violence in the form of death, and degraded bodies and environments. Deaths resulting from the toxic ecologies of settler colonialism are too martyrs in the struggle for liberation. So this chapter turns to the way electricity becomes both a target and a weapon, an instrumental asset in the militant settler arsenal for destruction and attempts at indigenous domination and pacification. Focusing on the weaponization of infrastructure in the aftermath of the unilateral Israeli disengagement from the Gaza Strip, it shows how settler colonialism is invested in waging a war not only on indigenous bodies, but also on the built and natural environment that ensures their biological and uh, social reproduction, their survival. Repression and resistance on the terrain of social reproduction pushes us to consider the entangled connections between land and bodies at the heart of feminist indigenous studies and struggles on environmental and reproductive justice. As the Women's uh, Earth Alliance and Native Youth South um, Sexual Health Network put it in a recent report, violence on the land is violence on our bodies. Seen through electricity as an infrastructure of social reproduction, not only contributes to breaching the connection between bodies, lands, and toxicity, <coughs> sorry, it also widens accounts of territoriality, which as Patrick Wolf observes, is settler colonialism, a specific irreducible element. Um, in this sense, the chapter thinks with Michelle Murphy about how to find words, protocols, and methods that might honor the inseparability of bodies and land, and at the same time grapple with the expansive chemical relations of settler colonialism that entangle life forms in each other's accumulations, conditions, possibilities, and misery. 
and in doing so, it engages with Wolf's logics of elimination to explore the more subtle and expansive toxic ecologies of settler colonialism, with the hope that this understanding give us the power to accept something liberatory on this place. Well, this all um, sounds great in writing, but I imagine it's not that easy to grasp when reading and listening. So I'm just going to um, move and try to um, to explain a bit more in detail what this all means. But essentially, again, what I want to emphasize is that what I'm interested in is to understand infrastructure networks like electricity or water or fuel as means of social reproduction that enable life, right? Um, and and, and I'm, I'm talking about social reproduction not only as the possibility of having an industry, because without uh, electricity, an industry cannot happen. Without an industry, we cannot have economic development, we cannot have social development, etc. But also, we cannot have biological uh, reproduction, right? Bodies stop. And so the other point that I want to emphasize is really that in a settler colonial context, it's not only the elimination of the body that is at stake, but that many times this also takes the elimination of the built environment, that is infrastructure, or the land itself you make that land toxic and you pollute that land so that indigenous life cannot happen, right? Um, so I take this moment of the disengagement, I don't know if you might recall this moment um, in, the, in 2006, um, 2005, uh, Israel withdraws the troops uh, and settlements from the Gaza Strip. There were about 8,000 Israeli settlers in the Gaza Strip. At the time, Ariel Saron, the former prime minister, the late former prime minister, um, was in charge and decided to pull the troops and the settlers out of the Gaza Strip, which were then moved to other locations throughout Palestine, in obviously other uh, settlements. Um, so, when that move happens, a lot of the infrastructure, so the settlements, the houses, um, everything except of the synagogues uh, were demolished so that the Palestinians could not reuse um, that housing and that infrastructure. Also, the electricity water infrastructure was left intact, that infrastructure that used to provide essential services to both settlers and indigenous people was left intact. And that's the kind of infrastructure that once Israel is pulled out, of the Gaza Strip, beyond the boundary that delimits the Gaza Strip, that's when those infrastructures began to be weaponized. Um, and so, the moment in which um, Israel pulls the troop out, it's a moment in which I don't think there has been um, I've been trying to think about what this moment actually means in the long history of settler colonial capitalism in Palestine. What does it mean that if settler colonialism is about taking the land, what does it mean when settlers all of a sudden pulled out of this kind of like, you know, very tiny and very strip dense area of population? And so if you sort of consider that in this little strip of land there were two million Palestinians or one million and a half at the time and only 8,000 settlers, obviously for the settler colonial project, for the state of Israel, that was not such an interesting thing to maintain. And so what happens is that in pulling out those troops, uh, they leave the two million people and they create a reserve. Some people have called a prison, right? There is walls, there is no way of getting in, getting out if it's not because or through the Israeli authorities, right? And that applies to, to all. So I try to think about what that means in terms of settler colonialism. And what I'm arguing in, in this particular chapter is that there is a closure of the frontier. Um, but we can talk about that um, later. And the other question is, um, why is it that all of a sudden Gaza is no longer interesting for Israel? Not only because there are two million people and it becomes very difficult um, to uh, manage um, and govern uh, two million people under settler colonial project, um, but I try to figure out a little bit more of the political economy of the situation. What is the situation? What happens after the occupation in 1967? The first intifada, Palestinians um, um, have an uprising in the early 80s uh, or late 80s and 87 uh, before the peace process happens. And so 
Um, the economy becomes uh, liberalized, things become privatized, um, there are less jobs for Israelis, and so there are less jobs as well for Palestinians. Uh, and so what you see here is the amount of people, uh, Palestinians, both in the West Bank and Gaza, that get employed uh, in, um, in Israel, uh, or by Israelis in settlements, whether in the West Bank or, or Gaza. And so Gaza is the orange line below, and what you see very clear is that the beginning of the second, in well, even at the beginning of the first intifada, as a way of punishment, Israel stops hiring um, Palestinians. And so at the same time that Israel stops hiring Palestinians, they start a process of enclosing the uh, Gaza Strip, putting up a wall, putting up um, um, a border that is impossible to go through unless, as I was saying, you go through the Israelis, right? And that, that's a process of, uh, of enclosure. So I try to understand the broader political economy that leads into this transformation. And um, I end up considering uh, that Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, particularly as opposed to the, to the West Bank, they become surplus. And surplus meaning uh, they become surplus to the economy, right? They were never tremendously relevant for the Israeli economy because they were never more than a 20%, like 16% of the uh, active population uh, in, uh, in Israel. And what happens after um, after the Oslo Accords in the 1990s, when you begin to see the line going down, is that whenever Israel needed more labor, they would hire people from either Africa or Asia, essentially. Uh, and also in the 1990s, there was a million of Eastern uh, Europeans, uh, Russian mostly, coming uh, into, um, into uh, Israel-Palestine. And so there's this kind of like replacement of labor that is fundamental for the economy to continue that makes the Palestinians redundant and surplus, right? They become existentially uh, surplus. And so here um, I have a, a little uh, sort of uh, quote, and I, I say to the settler state, having reduced its dependence on the Palestinian workers, gas and its labor bodies and physical existence becomes uh, existentially surplus, that is no longer necessary to capital as a potential source of labor, but instead are useful for their intrinsic lack of value. Um, and I've been trying to figure out what does it mean if you're not useful for the economy uh, and you cannot contribute to the economy, how are you useful, what value do you have in terms of being, um, um, what does it mean to have an intrinsic lack of value, no? and how is that valuable for the economy? And a lot of the, the, the transformations in the, Israeli, uh, in the Israeli economy has been to develop uh, major uh, technological um, military industry. And a lot of that military industry is premised on the fact that that technology is tested on the ground against Palestinians, right? So whenever you go to an exhibition, um, or whenever you read flyers of Israeli states selling their technology or companies, they always say battle tested, which means that as opposed to somebody else that is developing you know, a new technology that has not been tested, it has a value added. So I'm trying to think about that in that way. Um, but we can talk more about that later. So what happens is that because of that um, becoming surplus, uh, after uh, this engagement, but, but you know, it's a process that goes longer after the first intifada because of the resistance of the Palestinians, because of global transformations in the economy, because of local transformations in the economy in the, in the Palestinian context. Um, what ends up happening is an absolute total closure, right? And what you see there is not only a closure, which is the thick red line, but you also see a, a pinky section that becomes a buffer zone. So that buffer zone happens to be the area where Palestinian uh, farmers have most of their productive land. And that area becomes a buffer zone for Israelis, which means that from time to time they would go in with uh, bulldozers and erase uh, any tree that might make more difficult the visibility in order to this was say the insurgency, right? And what ends up happening is a lot of the agricultural economy cannot happen no longer because that buffer zone cannot be cultivated. 
Um, what also happens in that buffer zone and for avoiding not only trees but for like crops growing is that Israel will go and would like um, with planes would um, put pesticides right um, every year on a regular basis would put pesticides that not only kill the crops and make it unavailable the land for production but also make uh, the land um, toxic with the meaning that all those pesticides end up filtrating into the soil, which end up going into the water aquifer. Um, how about I go with this and you keep it for later? Yeah? Okay, great. Otherwise, I'll lose time track. And uh, um, so, um, so one of the things that I argue in this chapter is that you know, this closure also talks about the carceral logics of, um, of settler colonialism, right? And so Gaza is not an exception in Palestine. So if you see what is happening in the West Bank, what you see is that the ways in which the land has been divided, um, you know, and I don't have a, a map on that, but you know, the West Bank after the Oslo process was divided in areas A, B, and C. So areas A are the Palestinian urban areas, areas B are the areas that are more rural surrounding these areas A, and area C is the rest. And so areas B and C are fully in control by the Israelis. And areas A, which are the cities, major cities, are supposed to be under full control of Palestinians even though that at the end of the day, that's not what happens. But there is this division, a spatial division, which turns the territory into this kind of carceral spaces, right? So in the larger book, and in comparison with other cases, I try to see what these carceral logics are. Um, and I'll leave it at that for now. Um, so one of the main points that I'm um, trying to argue um, is how, as I say there, um, how thoroughly intertwined this bioterritorial process has become with the deadly regimes of social reproduction, particularly in the Gaza Strip on the aftermath of uh, this engagement. So I try to see how this spatial confinement is related to the way in which Israel is governing life, right? And infrastructure is precisely that point of encounter, right? Infrastructures are grounded on the territory, they cross the territory, not necessarily in lines, but they can be distributed, think about a road or an electricity grid. And what I'm trying to say is that those infrastructure are, you know, a good illustration of a point in encounter between a biopolitical project concerned with bodies and life and a geopolitical project which is concerned with territory, right? Um, so, um, so before I go into detail in what happens when, um, when Israel destroys the electricity plant, right? After they pull out all the troops, they destroy the electricity power plant, which was massive and had massive consequences. But before that, what I want to give you is a brief hint of how this process is not something that begins in the early 2000s, right? And how Already since 1967, the moment Israel invades and occupies the West Bank and Gaza, they size the electricity. So Palestinians had their own generators, their own power plants, their own grids. It was not significantly developed, but Palestinians had, you know, they were developing electricity as a way to be able to develop industry. As soon as Israel enters into the West Bank and Gaza, the first thing they do is to site do a military order to say that they are from that moment on in charge of anything and everything that has to do with electricity. The same will happen with water and other essential services. But what we're interested here is electricity. So what we see, what you see here um, on, on the right is a map of the, of the Gaza Strip and those red lines are essentially the electricity grid, right? And that electricity grid, what it makes is it connects. It's kind of like an umbilical cord, if you will. It connects the Gaza Strip and makes the Gaza Strip and its population dependent on electricity that is generated within the state of Israel, right? And that's a, sort of like a paradigmatic example of sizing the means of production, 
right? In this case, size in the means of uh, social reproduction. Because without electricity and without you being able to control the electricity, if you want to have a couple factories and you need to ask for permission uh, to have more electricity, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have the need to request from the Israelis, from the settlers, to give you more electricity. And that's, you know, what continues to happen. All those calculations of the settler state of how much water, how much electricity become part of the government mechanism of the settler state in the Palestinian context. So what I do in this chapter is to try to figure out those histories, what happens, how that materializes. So for instance, in 69, the mayor of Gaza City um, was dismissed because he refused to accept the connection of the Gaza uh, city into the Israeli electricity grid. And because he refused, he was taken out under uh, house arrest and replaced by somebody else, right? This is just a little, very tiny example. Um, but this policy of sizing the means of social reproduction has been essential for a policy of what you know, a scholar Sarah Roy calls the development. And essentially means that not only without this means of production you cannot develop your economy and have you know, social, economic, and development, but it has also been a way of regulate that, you know, that development. And so, you know, kind of like a, a carrot and a stick. If you want to do this, give me this, and I'll give you a bit more electricity, right? And that has happened um, with many um, different things. So I think that's clear. If you guys want, we can talk a little bit more about the, the history. Um, but um, now I just want to move on to the moment in which the electricity uh, power plan uh, is bombed. So what happens after this engagement, uh, 2005, after, a year after, there are elections in Palestine. Uh, and so people end up democratically voting and electing Hamas, which is a Palestinian uh, Islamist uh, resistant movement in Palestine. Uh, they won the elections and immediately Israel decided to intervene. Uh, not only Israel, but also the European Union in many different ways, um, kind of like comply with what Israel was doing. Um, so once the troops were out, once Hamas has won those elections and it starts to begin attempting to configure a government, what Israel does is to bomb the power plant. So all the six generators producing electricity were bombed. Now, what I tried to do, and that's the idea of the diameter of the bomb, which is based on a poem by a Zionist um, national poet, is to try to understand, you know, sort of like the, the impacts and the consequences, right? And if you, if you imagine a diameter of, cons you know, um, circular, concentric, sort of, that extends, you know, you begin to see. And I do this by trying to do a political ecology that tries to connect the destruction of the power plant with pollution, with health problems, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I'm going to try to explain um, in, 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 this, um, in this section. Um, so one of the things that happen, obviously, the most obvious and immediate consequence of destroying the power plant is that you know, there is no more electricity. So what ends up happening is that the electricity has been reduced to the minimum. So essentially, I don't know if you see here, but on, on top what you have is the, avail the availability of electricity, hours per day, and this is taken on a month uh, in uh, 2017, right? So um, essentially uh, what you have is seven hours of electricity, eight hours, four hours, five hours, so you can, you can see. Uh, and so below what you see is who provides that electricity, right? So on blue is the Israeli um, electricity provided to the Gaza Strip. Um, in yellow is, two, um, uh, is the Egyptian electricity provided. There is just like one single line is like pretty much negligible as you can see before and after the bombing. Uh, and then you see the electricity generated by the Gaza power plant. And Gaza produces electricity by fuel, fuel which it also gets from Israel, right? And so if Israel decides to shut the fuel, then no electricity can be produced either. But this is just to give you a glimpse, and so the gray is the gap. So the gap means that all of that is what is needed in order to provide and service all the population in Gaza. 
So what happens is that when the electricity gets destroyed, everything stops working. So the example that I gave you at the beginning of the introduction where I say that because there is no electricity, wastewater plants cannot function, means that all that waste needs to be thrown into the sea before it gets treated, right? It's not that before it wasn't treated, is that, or it wasn't thrown into the sea, sorry. But before it was treated, right? It's oxygenated in certain pools and then it can be safely thrown into the, into the sea. With no electricity, those pools that are treating the electricity don't work. And so everything that is being thrown into the sea is polluted. But that's only part of it, right? Because then what happens is that the water that is polluted on the coastline begins to um, filter into the aquifer, right? Um, into the aquifer, which is the water surface that lies under the land of the Gaza Strip, right? So all of that pollution gets into the Gaza aquifer. And the Palestinians in Gaza, what they do is they extract from water wells the water. So when that water is all polluted, right now that water is 90% or 95% undrinkable, right? So there is no drink water that can be drink. This is, and so what I'm trying to say is precisely how that connection between the lack of electricity, the sewage that goes polluted and then pollutes the water, you have there a sort of like form of, you know, ecological, if you will, political circle uh, that explains a little bit what is happening. But you have to imagine as well that the lack of electricity also uh, impedes the possibility of elevators running. And Gaza is no, you know, uh, people are not living in, in shacks, right? It's a very urbanized society with roads, very modern urban society, with big buildings, uh, with elevators, and all what you would expect from a modern urban city. So um, it's very dense. There are two million people in the Gaza Strip. So a lot of the elevators stop working without electricity. That means that if you're getting your groceries, uh, if you have old people living, uh, there is no electricity happening. If you want to study, there is no light you cannot study, you cannot run your machines, and the electricity provision becomes random, right? Because it took a long time for Palestinians to be able to figure out, uh, for the Palestinian company, of course, to figure out how to you know, manage all that you know, electricity distribution, where eventually what they would do is provide electricity for a while into one neighborhood and then shut it down and give it to another one. But many times the electricity would be provided after midnight, right? So either you would have to stay awake and do everything until very late at night, or if you're at work at two o'clock in the afternoon, you'll have to go back, whatever. Um, so that's another of the um, consequences. Um, this is a diagram that explains what I was trying to say in terms of like uh, sewage and pollution. Those are all the pumps that are um, pushing the, the sewage um, water. Um, we've talked about this. So um, another of the, which doesn't appear here, but another of the major um, problems of the electricity has to do with public health. Right, so a lot of the um, big consequences has been to hospitals, and you have to like imagine that all of a sudden you just like go and walk through an entire hospital, all the floors, all the rooms, and you try to imagine what is happening. So say like a premature baby, you know, needs electricity, uh, no electricity. No premature baby, uh, essentially. Uh, think about, you know, like intensive care. All of that, in the moment that happened, there was no preparation whatsoever. Um, there were no generators. Electricity used to function properly before, so there was no readiness to it. Today, the situation has changed slightly in the sense that there is slightly more electricity and people are more prepared with more generators. But generators are difficult to get in because under a siege situation, you cannot necessarily uh, get the spare parts needed to repair your generators. You cannot get the fuel, which is very expensive, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So a, a, a lot of the things that I'm trying to do here is to try to understand how the destruction of electricity had major implications uh, for life, uh, but also for the territory, right? And in this sense, I try to think about um, settler colonialism, you know, uh, as I was saying before, says that the, the ultimate aim of settler colonialism is territoriality. That's what what settlers want. They want to size territory, right? And so what I'm also trying to think here is about 
what does it mean to think territory in this way? All of a sudden, we need to consider territory beyond land, right? And we need to consider not only the land, but also the sea. That also conforms this, the territoriality, right? We, t we, we think about the, the, the land, we think about the sea, we think about toxicity, and those are elements that constitute life within that territoriality, right? And that's, again, essentially what I'm trying to do in this, um, in this particular chapter is to investigate how settler colonialism operates. And it really is about understanding forms of violence and forms of governance and how that happens in terms of bodies and land and how that is connected uh, with infrastructure, which for me in the book remains the entry point to, to figure out these things, right? Um, and so also trying to figure out that, you know, usually infrastructures and electricity are, you know, perhaps not consider at all in your everyday life until they break, but try to, you know, what I try to do is highlight the importance of these networks um, and, 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 and try to figure out how they become weaponized, right? Um, both as a target of destruction, right? The electricity plant gets, gets destroyed, but also without destroying that infrastructure, how that, you know, electricity grid can be manipulated in order to, you know, put pressure, political pressure to extract or even kill. Um, so, yeah, I think this is about it. I know it's depressing, but uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> So yeah, no, no way. Um, so um, I don't know if one of the maps um, you can see that, but um, yeah. So see, you see, there is like a buffer zone on the sea, and that keeps on shrinking, right? So it used to be when the Oslo Peace Accords happened, or the Oslo Accords, which is like a colonial treaty, essentially. Uh, when that happens, there was a definition of you know how much. Um, in the Palestinians could go. And that's been shrinking, it's monitor, it's patrol, a lot of fishermen um, get killed and shot at, um, their boats confiscated, um, people in prison. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen, but like there have been several campaigns which have attempted to you know, break the siege. And so people have tried to go through the boat and get into the Gaza Strip, that, but you know, like activists and uh, intellectuals and all the people concerned about what's going on in Gaza, uh, and that doesn't work. So it's, yeah, uh, fully controlled. Um, it's like literally a prison. So I haven't looked at all the contexts yet. So like that's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to finish this um, life stage, get the book done, and then I would like to see, you know, try to figure out other contexts. Although to be very honest, I keep on wondering what does it mean to like spend a decade in a place trying to figure out how it works politically and then jumping into a totally different context and just say, well, this is the same, right? And then. Um, but anyway, we'll figure that out. But no, I haven't really um, looked at other places in depth. Um, I know uh, that these are strategies like weaponizing infrastructure. I mean, particularly the destruction of it um, is something that is a, a tactic of warfare as long as, you know, infrastructure probably exists, no? Um, so poisoning water in you know, in the Roman Empire or uh, whatever. So I, I think this, you know, it's long, uh, it exists, and you see this happening. I did look at internet at some point in Palestine when I began, um, 
to the point where a lot of the disruption or that weaponization was about disrupting the possibility of managing telecommunications. So in the case of Palestine, what happened is that, again, the Oslo Colonial Treaty, what it did is to make a lot of calculations. So everything was calculated. You know, Israelis decided this amount of water in the next 10 years, this amount of electricity, and then for telecommunications, you know, there's like a spectrum, right? Um, so for that spectrum, the Palestinians were given a very tiny spectrum. Um, and even when that um, happened, then they would, um, so like I talk with private telecommunication companies, um, one uh, called Jawal. And at the time, what they were telling me and explaining was that uh, because they were, Israelis were not allowing to import a lot of the infrastructure to create the telecommunication system, they ended up doing uh, a lot of, um, you know, bypassing um, as a way to continue. So what they would do is to send, so if you were calling, say, from Ramallah to Hebron, uh, the call would be um, diverted into London, from Ramallah to London, from London to Hebron, Hebron, uh, London, and back. Right, so they, you know, like there, there are coping me mechanisms uh, in which, and we haven't talked really on, on this, it's not that, you know, Palestinians are passive victims, uh, but there are always coping mechanisms when it comes to, to these forms. But yeah, I think it'll be interesting to one day, you know, like put this thing um, together with other cases. Thanks. Um, so, not really. Uh, I mean, the Palestinian um, liberation movement at this point is at its lowest point. Um, so, the degree of political fragmentation that has happened um, during the last century, um, you know, has peaks and downs. And I think that right now we are in, in, in a valley. Uh, so there is not so much, I think there is a movement now that is concerned about, you know, issues of uh, ecology and agroecology that manifest in, you know, people working the land, thinking about seeds, trying to recover in the histories of seeds and practices of agriculture. Uh, but it's not necessarily that people are articulating um, explicitly a discourse that is, you know, environmental or ecological. If anything, I guess because the problems are so severe that you know um, people don't really have the, um, the time or energy right now to to articulate a political project that you know has you know multiple dimensions and uh, but you know there are little groups here and there that little by little are trying to recover from this, especially the younger generation. So, um, but yeah, step by step. Um, you mean inside the Gaza Strip? So there are no Israelis, officially. Um, so, I mean, I think like about six months ago, about a year, um, a bunch of Israelis were caught dressing up as humanitarians um, in a car. And so there was like this massive operation where I think... Um, I don't know, one or two Israelis died and the other ones were like quickly taken out um, by helicopter uh, and then a bunch of Palestinians were killed. Um, so the, the control happens at the, at the gates, right? So if you, I mean, I, I don't think you see, I think there are some dots. Um, yeah. yeah, or yeah, it's not very clear, but that's where, you know, essentially the control. But then, like, you have drones, right? So drones are, like, patrolling all the time. You have planes. Uh, you have the patrols on the sea. Uh, so essentially, that's how, um, how Israel kind of controls. And then, you know, they have a lot of people. So another thing, which is kind of um, also barbaric, 
um, is uh, Israelis get uh, people to collaborate. So a lot of the highly specialized medical treatment that you would want to have in the Gaza Strip, uh, you might not be able to have it there, so you have to maybe go to Jerusalem, um, to other hospitals. And so whenever, say, you have a cancer, um, then you would need a permit in order to be able to live, right? You need a permit. Like every time you want to move, you need a permit, and nobody gets permits. Um, but if you're sick and you have a cancer, you want to go to Jerusalem, um, you have to sit with um, the Israeli authorities in one of these, you know, edge areas. And then they say, well, you want a permit then, you know, why don't you tell me who lives beside you? Who is your neighbor? Who is doing this? Who is doing that? No? And so that's how, like, a process of, you know, getting people to collaborate in exchange in very precarious situations, right? Um, so that's also other way in which this happens. Control, yeah. So I think it's kind of like <coughs> difficult to, well, yeah, to try to understand how on earth, independently of your political stance, you know, uh, something like this can be allowed to happen. I mean, like in the last kind of like decade, um, Israel has bombed systematically in three major operations, right? Killing about 5,000 people, injuring, you know, uh, it's crazy. Um, now, the reasons why this is it, I think, you know, when, when I, uh, I get asked this question, I say this, it's just like, yeah, but, but, no, it's like, I mean, I think in terms of empire, you know, if you're to look at this, Israel plays a very, you know, fundamental role in that region. And it, you know, it has a, the support of the United States of America, and it has a European Union that is useless. Um, and I mean, literally useless. I mean, they could, they do have leverage to do stuff, and and they haven't done it. The reasons why, you know, I think they are very different. Um, I also think that the fact that the European Union needs to act as a coherent body means that those that might have a different take or a more progressive take or a more just take on Palestine, not only Gaza, um, will be diluted within the decisions of all the European Union members. Uh, so I think that, you know, um, makes it more difficult to get everybody on board for like, you know, um, say, uh, undo the, the trade agreement with Israel until it complies with, you know, international humanitarian law, right? But there's no way, see the thing is that Europeans are very constrained because Palestinians are under Israeli control, right? Like in the West Bank is the same thing. Like if, you, if I want to travel to the West Bank, I always have to go through Israel, whether it's through the Jordan Valley or through the airport, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, so it's not that the, you know, like 
Europeans have been putting tons of money um, in building the, the institutions of a future Palestinian state. Uh, but what is clear by now, after two decades, and that's why they've stopped putting so much money, uh, but not only that, now they are cutting money on things as essential as UNRWA, which is the you know, institution that is in charge of the Palestinian refugees since the 1948. And that it's an essential you know, sort of institution with all its problems, because it does have many problems, but it's still very relevant, right? Um, so it is the political, you know, so European can put as much money as they want. Take for instance, you know, they usually, Belgium usually puts money in development, in infrastructures, on the Jordan Valley, in order to give electricity for communities. Israel comes and destroys that. And then Belgium says, well, why do they destroy that? And Israel says, well, what do you care? And things go on the same way, right? Um, in the second intifada, a lot of the money that you know um, the European Union had already invested got destroyed. You know, Europeans never got compensated by that. I mean, certainly not enough for all what they've done, right? So the European Union is very tied in terms of it's not a matter of money, or you cannot give power unless you put pressure on Israel. That's the only way. And you know, it's not like you're going to ask the European Unions to invade Israel. Is that you're going to negotiate diplom diplomatically with them? It's like. Either you stop killing people and stop taking, stop taking land, or we're not going to trade with you. You're not going to be a priority partner. That sounds like a very non-violent, fair kind of measure, right? Um, so in terms of you know, the, the rupture between Gaza and the West Bank, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's brutal. Like, I think like younger generations um, in Gaza today have not come out. Like People that are 25 years old have never gone out of you know, um, Gaza. So that means they've never seen um, the West Bank or their family in the West Bank or the family in the Middle East or the family in the diaspora, whatever they might be. Um, so the, the rupture is, you know, is not... It's, it's like, it's a conscious rupture, right? Uh, and that doesn't help in order to facilitate, you know, that. Um, but obviously there are internal politics too, um, to Hamas uh, running the Gaza Strip and Fatah, uh, the other political party running uh, the West Bank, and they are the ones that are supposed to come to terms to how to face this settler colonial project by getting together, yeah. They do, they do, they do interact. And like you, you might be surprised of how people end up interacting, you know, especially online, right? Um, and then there are people that are allowed to travel. Um, I'm talking about people that are in the administration. Yeah. Uh, but did Israel impose any type, like Israel or any type of organization impose any, uh, any, any censorship or any type of censorship or internet inside uh, the Gaza Strip or inside the Palestinian? Uh, actually, I don't think um, internet has been a thing. Um, if any, the Palestinian Authority has put pressure on Palestinians themselves um, by doing surveillance over people that have divergent political views with either the government in Gaza or the government in uh, but I don't think uh, you know internet has been restricted in 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 that way. I mean, besides the way that we were talking before, no, there have been. Um, it wouldn't look good on Israel, and and even though like Israel now, I don't think cares that much as it used to in terms of what people would think. But yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. 
Wait, let's let's get somebody there and then we go back to you. Yeah. In terms of the water and electricity and um, no, it's kind of like um, actually there are other involvements, right? So it's like you, you begin to look at very closely at this. So thing is that Israel has been a very particular case in terms of the economy and they've only begin to liberate uh, as in like liberalized their you know infrastructure sectors very recently. Uh, I think, you know, for all purposes, the Israeli electricity company still remains a public company, which is kind of like an exception in many places. Um, but um, um, what you see is, you know, the way in the West Bank, for instance, different infrastructures are managed, are subcontracted oftentimes by different European or international companies. And that's when you begin to see, you know, um, different actors that become involved. And I don't know if you guys know about the boycott, divestments and sanctions campaign, but you know, many times those campaigns are doing the research of trying to figure out who is doing what. And so, for instance, there has been like, you know, known cases of a tramway being built in Jerusalem that would connect, you know, the west part of the city with the east part of the city and the settlements, the illegal uh, Israeli settlements. Um, and so, you know, some of those companies are French companies, Spanish companies have been trying to get those contracts. So you do see that, you know, in um, different um, cases you find um, corporate actors being involved as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the, another question that I had is that uh, basically Israel made uh, people, like live people in Gaza, Gaza as basically a hell on earth, um, as an analogy. Uh, for example, with the with the with the con like contaminating their water and contaminating what they have, uh, couldn't this be used as like an analogy of uh, of a biological weapon? Also, and one other thing is one one of the other thing is if Israel doesn't uh, care anymore so much about what the what the world thinks about them, what is stopping them from invading, uh, for example, the Gaza or uh, the Gaza Strip or anything like that? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Israel in the last half a year has bombed Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, besides Palestine. And, you know, I mean, uh, for those of us that follow the, you know, political situation in the area, that's like, and no, nothing happens, right? Like if the the other thing would happen that, you know, like Syria all of a sudden or anybody else would like, you know, just throw a, a bomb, it will be like a total scandal, no? Um, so, I mean, as long as the political forces, um, the balance of political forces, you know, um, remain attached to, you know, countries like the United States or the European Union in their current institutional arrangement and, you know, um, politics and especially in this moment with people like Trump or, you know, your own Bolsonaro or, um, yeah, many others. Um, yeah, Netanyahu. Um, yeah. So, again, there are always options and, you know, like the Palestinians are trying to get their shit together, uh, literally, in and out. And, you know, and solidarity still remains a very powerful tool to, um, you know, to engage. And so I already mentioned this boycott divestment action campaign. Uh, it's a way and there are many people with organizations and, you know, many ways of trying to do something about it. Uh, Um, so, look, there are many people trying to push now. There was like a, this week, I think, the last 10 days, you know, like people doing a campaign in the, um, in the, um, in the NHAG, in the International Court of Justice, um, to, to ask them to, 
to ask them about all the sort of files that they've submitted uh, that are lying on a pile and nobody is addressing them, right? Um, but then again, you know, the International Court of Justice is what it is. The law is what it is. And that doesn't mean that one need not to engage with like different political spheres, the law being one of them. Many Palestinians go to the Israeli High Court of Justice. Who would want to get justice out of the Israeli High Court of Justice? Very little justice is going to be found there, right? Very little justice is going to be found in the International Court of Justice. But, you know, these are spheres of action that need to be occupied, need to be exploited, need to be used. Um, sometimes to show the contradiction uh, and sometimes to try to get uh, a delay in, you know, when I was explaining settler colonialism, what settler colonialism is, is that we want the territory and we want to get rid of the people, right? That is the framework, the theoretical framework as it is, is a logic of elimination, right? And that's not exclusively in Palestine. Um, think about the Spaniards here going into the Americas, right? It's a bit farther away, uh, but it's the, you know, uh, very often the same logic with other cases that we've talked about. So that's the logic. You know, as soon as we understand that, then we can get much more clarity about what the occupation is. Because, you know, one of the things I didn't say before is that settler colonialism is useful not only to try to understand what's happening in West Bank and Gaza, but try to figure out what's happening with Palestinians. The Nakab, for instance, which is in the south of the, of the West Bank, but inside officially of Israel, has a large Bedouin population. And many of those Bedouins, which are Palestinians, are being expropriated from their lands. Right, um, <clears throat> in cities uh, like Haifa or Akka or even Tel Aviv uh, or Jaffa, uh, gentrification is going nuts, right? Um, and so many Palestinians are being kicked out by other means. So, you know, that logic of elimination takes many forms. What I explained today through this weaponization of social reproduction, of the means of social reproduction, is one form. But, you know, it takes many different forms. And it is important to understand what those forms are and take into consideration what is happening in, you know, the entire land of Palestine from the river to the sea. And also historicize this to get a proper sense of, you know, what are the, the trajectories? When has it changed? When it hasn't? And how has it? And why it has changed? And try to figure out, you know, if there are ways in which we can find weak spots and try to maybe, you know, find um, more um, hopeful political horizons. That's kind of heavy for a Friday uh, evening. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, um, so that's really serious, um, what is happening, because it sort of encroaches on, you know, um, on the liberties of people to begin with, to say what they want, to do what they want in ways that are nonviolent and legal, and um, uh, so that's worrying because of that. And so when I was saying, you know, like Netanyahu, Bolsonaro, Trump, I don't, I, indeed, I don't think, you know, it's necessarily that things were different, you know, like with Obama, no? It's like people are these days criticizing people that are meeting George Bush, but, you know, not uh, people that are meeting with Obama, right? Which also um, um, bombarded the shit out of the Middle East with drones, you know, um, and, and put people in prison, etc. cetera. Um, so I think it's a very worrying trend. It's not new in the sense that, you know, Zionism has always deployed all the weapons it has in order to, you know, try to um, 
to make it more difficult to, to, to make visible and challenge the realities of uh, what's going on in, in Palestine. Um, and so, yeah, when you have like a context like Germany, where um, I think is the first European parliament that has passed um, a resolution uh, with the understanding that BDS, the boycott, divestment, sanction is considered anti-Semite. Um, I hope that that you know, doesn't move forward. I mean, I can understand that that happens in Germany given their history and, and their problems in trying to come to terms with their guilt, et cetera, et cetera. Not to say that there is not anti-Semitism, uh, but there is also many other forms of racism that need to be taken into consideration, right? And I don't think there is m something more racist than um, making um, um, that making the comparison between you know anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, right? I think Zionism has been extremely uh, destructive of Jewish communities around the world um, in terms of different languages spoken, different political understandings, different religious views. Um, and so Zionism has become this very national, settler colonial, um, supremacist, racist movement that has created a monster. And I think many Jews in the world don't want to be identified with this. Um, and I think that what is a problem is to, you know, um, sort of conflate um, anti-Zionism with, with anti-Semitism. And I think people are alert, and it's not that people are not alert, but the pressures are high, are really like, you know, um, the pressures are substantial and like see what's happening in the Labour Party, right? Um, with the BBC and like people saying that they're like a bunch of anti-Semites because they know that Jeremy Corbyn, you know, if he does get to power that is to be seen, would have a very progressive policy with regards to Palestine Israel. So. It's worrying, um, but you know, I think what needs to happen is people continue to insist that this is not the case. And I think also, as we are seeing already, many Jews are coming forward, and I think that's also an important, really an important part. It's also up to them to say, you know, rather than to Palestinians or, or any others, you know, only to do that. It's up to Jews to say, we don't want this to happen in our name. And I think a little bit of that is starting to happen, so. So, I mean, I'm, I'm still hopeful, right? Um, I mean, I, I do think that um, sooner or later um, this will get fixed. I don't know how it would happen, um, but I am optimistic in that. And, you know, for me, the formula is certainly um, one. Uh, which is on my own personal, um, but I think that it's up to people on the ground to figure out what they want. And the thing is that Palestinians wanted originally as part of the you know, revolution that was waged by the PLO and the many different political factions that took place within uh, that revolution in the 70s, 80s. Um, and so I think it is up to Palestinians to figure out um, you know, what that is. Um, Many Palestinians only want to just be able to live a normal life, and you would hear that a lot. Uh, many other Palestinians think one state is the way to go, where everybody is under the same government, has the same rights, one person, one vote. Doesn't matter that you're a Jew, or you're Muslim, or you're a Christian, or you're whatever you are. Um, there are other people that still think that the two-state you know, uh, 
could be an option and then like the settlements would be removed or they will be given citizenship in the West Bank. I mean, I don't think nothing is un undoable in that sense. Um, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a bit of um, a problem to think about solutions before we put an end to the injustice, right? And I think that that's kind of like um, maybe a way. But I do personally feel that, you know, I mean, I would even go farther. It's like what like a no state solution look like and, you know, like make this an example of like a really, truly, genuinely experimental revolutionary project, right? Um, where we don't see what's been happening after liberation in many of the 70s, 60s, 50s, you know, all that decolonization, where as soon as, you know, peoples liberated themselves and they got trapped into, you know, the nation state, they ended up, you know, failing all those ideals that, you know, um, look so good. So, but yeah, I'm hopeful. I don't know how, when, but I think it's still up to, to Palestinians to think about that. So again, I think, you know, if like, I mean, Israel is a hyper-militarized country, right? And if you go with 18 years old to do, or like 19 or 20 to do two or three years, three years if you're a man, two years if you're a woman, um, you know, in that very formative moment of your life, I think it becomes, you know, pretty easy to be kind of um, brainwashed, right? Because your experience is your experience. You go there and you meet people and it's cool, right? Like you get a weapon, you get a uniform, you do this, you do that. And like you are put into the situation where, you know, you are dehumanizing other people. Um, and, you know, that, that goes, you know, really deep, um, again, in, in the way you become um, a, a person in those early years. But... As I was saying, I think that, you know, um, I think in the U.S. there are a lot of campaigns of people that are brought into uh, Israel uh, as a way to visit the country, to uh, see how things are, and maybe as a as an step towards, you know, joining the army and do Aliyah, you know, that moment of getting and claiming your citizenship for the fact of being Jew, while Palestinian refugees that were kicked out in 48 cannot claim that right and are still, you know, in exile in the diaspora. Um, and so many of these campaigns in the U.S. are by Jews themselves trying to sabotage these campaigns, joining those campaigns, going and in the bus, all of a sudden speaking up and saying, look, this is unfair what you're saying. What you're saying is not true. Um, and then people are organizing on the ground, trying to, you know, show that, you know, all these organizations that are doing. But like, you know, again, it's like, if I would be in Brazil and I'm a Jew and I'm an anti-Zionist, I would maybe want to be interested in trying to convince other fellows to not go to do the army because to begin with, joining the army is awful in itself as it is, Israel or not. 
but if on top of it, you know, you just go to Palestine, it makes things. Uh... Wait, there is somebody there. Mm -hmm. Do you think the propaganda is a reality? Do you think it's a reality? How uh, do you think that this can affect like the Jews in the, the European and Tory world? Mm. And not spoil a lie of how we say in the past week, because that's the most popular thing. Mm. I don't think the Palestinian Authority has much legitimacy at this point, to be honest. But, uh, and <laughs> presence of Hamas, I mean, as I said, in 2006, I was there in January. Um, um, Hamas won the elections both in the West Bank and Gaza, right? It's like there is no separation here. So you need to understand that, you know, families and people in both places, in both areas, you know, voted in majority for Hamas. So it's not that, like, Hamas infiltrates into the West Bank, right? Um, people vote, you know, here, the Socialist Party, or, unfortunately, or Vox, or, unfortunately, or somebody else. Um, and there is the same thing, right? There is Fatah, there is Hamas, so it's not that they infiltrate and, and appear, right? And I think Hamas has also been, you know, very delegitimized um, because they've been turned into Islamic extremists, etc. Which, curiously enough, has worked, you know, in many ways to make the Hamas movement more, you know, um, more focus on the national liberation project, so not, not just focus, but like, you know, bringing forward more the agenda for national liberation than they've been like putting to bring the Islamist agenda, right? Um, because of everything that has happened. Hamas wasn't given the opportunity to govern. And I'm not saying that I support Hamas or that I support the, the ideology of, of Hamas. But what you cannot do is to vote um, so to go there with European and international representatives, monitor an electoral, an electoral process, uh, and then just like say, well, we don't like the result of this election, we're taking them out, and do whatever it takes to do that, right? Which is essentially what, what has happened. Um, so, yeah, I think Palestinians are against a lot of, um, yeah, if they are nonviolent, like BDS, it's because if nonviolent, if they use armed struggle, it's because they use armed struggle. If they use whatever means, it's never good enough. So there are no way of challenging Zionism. You know, it's never good enough. There is no, um, no way. So that, I don't think that that's an important matter for Palestinians or people that are struggling for justice, you know, this discussion about whether it gets legitimized or not. Um, it makes things harder, but you just move forward. And do you see there is like a possible link between like Hamas and other regional groups such as Hezbollah? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I certainly think that that's the case. I mean, if you see the region in the last year, a lot of things have happened, right? I mean, like, the region is boiling. And it's not only, you know, Hamas and Hezbollah, but it's also Iran. I mean, the United States uh, has come into the picture thinking, because they don't know. They think they are, like, dealing with, like, tribes, like in Afghanistan, right? Um, which is true. There are tribes, right? But they don't understand shit. They get into a mess where, you know, they don't even know how to get out. And then all of a sudden they do what they are doing now in Kurdistan, North Syria, right? Where they, you know, somebody decides... Uh, whomever, whether that is Trump or his advisors, doesn't matter, but like they just get out uh, of help, you know, of, of, of an area of, you know, um, a people and an army uh, with men and women that have been, you know, uh, helping them to challenge and to get rid of ISIS, right? Um, so it is a deterrent in the sense that, you know, um, I don't think a lot of Western powers are um, at this point able to do so much, right? And like, I think everybody knows that if they do something and they take the lead or the initiative, something big might happen, and that is deterrence, right? That something is not necessarily happening big now, I think it's, you know, a matter of, of deterrence. Unfortunately, it's happened by force at this point. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, we think part of it has to do with this realignment of forces between Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states with Israel, with the US,
um, and then turning uh, or trying to attempting to turn Iran into a party up, where Iran is like, you know, it's a massive country. Uh, the Persian Empire has a history. These people are not Iraq, you know, so, um, and I don't think there is understanding of the, of the region. And, uh, and when you see uh, Trump, I mean, again, and it's not that it's only Trump, right? Trump is a, is a gimmick. But, you know, like when you hear this, this man speaking, you know, it's like he clearly doesn't know what's going on, has zero knowledge of, of, of the area. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I thought. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, no, I remember there was this thing, no, in, um, I think it was somewhere in Andalusia, and there was like a factory, and I think uh, there was the whole thing of sending weapons to Yemen, uh, right, to Saudis for attacking Yemen. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a matter of organizing, right? Um, so organizing meaning the workers need to organize and need to figure out what is good for them and what is not good for them. And, you know, um, a lot of these factories do have unions, and so I think these are issues that need to be put in the, in the uh, issues that need to be put in the agendas of the union, and they need to consider how to go about, how to preserve a certain amount of, um, you know, work incoming in terms of working in such an industry, um, and then figure out what are the, you know, um, what's the, the balance between, you know, sending tanks or weapons uh, of any kind to a country that is bombing, you know, um, uh, a people. Um, I also think that beyond the workers themselves out of the factories, then people as well should organize, no? And like anti-militarism has been and still is, you know, one easy way of campaigning against, you know, having weapons and, but then effectively, the industry is, you know, very important. In Israel today, the military industry, you know, it's not clear what drives, you know, if the colonial project or the industry, what drives, because war, you know, is good for business. So um, um, it's a tough one. Um, but I think that if I were, you know, nearby at some point, somewhere near one of those factories, I would want to sit and like, you know, discuss if for instance somebody, I think BDS again, Boycott Divestment Sanctions is been uh, doing that kind of work. Um, trying to figure out where they can touch, whether it's a bank, whether it's a factory, you know. Um, so there is a lot of work and thinking and strategizing, political strategizing, that goes into deciding what part of the assemblage is better to tackle and, you know, what part is going to affect a less number of people, especially when it comes to workers that are dependent on that, right? So should we go for the bank that finances that company or should we go by the company and you know, try to figure that out? And I think there is a lot of work in there and we need to like, really think about what's best. Um, so yeah, but yeah. Yeah. I think that we should be exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.